Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very challenging and interesting one entitled Preparation for the End Time. And this is lesson number four in that series for April 28 of 2018 entitled Salvation and the End Time. Salvation and the End Time. What do you suppose that will be about? Well, let's find out, but we always start with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, as always, we ask your guidance. We ask that you come especially close to us as we read this very important this lesson and we study it and we discuss it together that what we say and, and do may be a benefit to those who are listening in is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Christianity is a unique religion, probably for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is that in all the other major religions, what do you do? The challenge is for you to do something to make yourself better so that you can advance and get saved in whatever the saved means in, in, in that particular religion. But in Christianity, what happened? Christ not only challenged us to live better lives, which is always, always appropriate, but he also came and showed us the way and died to demonstrate the truth about God and answer the questions Satan had raised in the great controversy. So here's a God who comes down and is personally involved in answering those questions and making the way for us uh, back to heaven. So Ellen White made a comment about that. Um, Fred? If you would gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in man, and then present the subject to the angels of God as acting a part in the salvation of the human <coughs> soul or in merit, the proposition would be rejected as treason. Wow. This is from uh, Ellen White, Faith and Works, page 24. Rejected as treats, so sounds like we don't have too much to recommend ourselves, do we? Mm -hmm. As Jesus was giving his final instructions to, uh, to his disciples on that eventful evening in the upper room, and they knew, he knew, that this was going to be his last night with them, but they didn't know, he spoke about how we can go to the Father. As we know, Philip said, well, Lord, show us the Father. That's all we need, John 14, 8. And well, how did Jesus respond, Dennis? John 14, 9, Jesus answered, For a long time I have been with you all, yet you do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Why then do you say, show us the Father? Um, have you Bible, well, that's the good news translation that we usually use. Uh, have you ever stopped and asked yourself, were they going, with their eyes going like this? And they, Hold on. We weren't asking about you. We know you. Whoever's seen you has seen the Father? We know about that God of the Old Testament. What does that have to do with you? I mean, yeah. I don't know how it strikes you, but I, I, I like to put myself into these pictures and say, what, what would I, how would I have responded? Here's a person I've been living with for three years now, or maybe it's only a year or two, but quite a while, and I think I know him pretty well, and now he's all of a sudden he's equal to God? Well, even Isaiah 9... Yeah, they remembered it uh, at the crucifixion and resurrection, especially in the 40 days after that. That's when it all came back to them. But remember that to them, the God of the Old Testament was a God of vengeance and fire and justice. Many of them chose not, I mean, many of the modern Christians choose not even to read the Old Testament because they think it's not appropriate. And yet he showed himself to Abraham and uh, others before him. Yeah. And they were not afraid. They were not... <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if Jesus did a, a faithful representation, maybe there was a problem with the Bible uh, transcribing. Of course, you got uh, Jeremiah 8, verse 8. You scribes have made the, the word, your words into a lie. You yeah. made the... the, the well, the, but there's, there's many parts of the Old Testament suggesting that God is loving and kind, and we're going to look at some of those verses a little bit later, but... 
Well, that wasn't what they were generally focusing on. Jesus did not advocate the killing of anybody. Uh, do, you, do you see anything in the Bible that says that we should separate the New Testament from the Old Testament? No. no. The primary reason why Jesus came to this world was to teach us the truth about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Gordon, you're going to have several words here, a fairly lengthy thing. Let's, let's listen closely and we'll want to maybe comment in the middle. This is from Ellen White, letter 83, 1895. Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, humbling himself, veiling his glory that humanity might look upon him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight, in hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. Do you think the disciples believed that before, the, before the, that final weekend? Even during the final weekend until, until after resurrection, until the road to Emmaus. Yeah. Well, maybe even 40 days after yeah. the cross. They're yeah. studying about it. Yeah. yeah. So, once again, putting yourself in that situation, how would you have responded there in the upper room to Jesus' statement? You are God? Well, what was the picture they had in those days, and what does it teach us about, about God? Uh, I think it goes on. You have another quotation there? Yes, here's a, something that you quote often from Ellen White, Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions and represented and God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. Can I interrupt for a second now? How do you suppose the evil one convinced the Jews to believe those terrible things about God? All the pagan worships they adopted in many cases um, brought them that erroneous view of God. Okay, that could never happen to us, right? Well, a, oh, third, yes, of the angels were, <laughs> a third of the angels were convinced. Yeah. So it's not just humans. It's not just us dumb humans. It was angels. Wow. That's scary. It is. Okay. Again, he was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. Jesus came to teach men of the Father, to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Wow. And think of all the different way, different things people have suggested as to why Jesus came, what he was here for. So many people think, well, he died just for our salvation. But what does this say? He came to set and keep men right. The only way he could do that was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Now, what does that have to do with our salvation? Well, and then he disappeared mm -hmm. some, a few days later, a few weeks later, and there's never in, uh, no record of him physically appearing since that time. He's l given us a record like this of it having, and others to, to, to teach their kids and their, and their friends and relatives and so on and so forth. That's all we have. Mm -hmm. We don't have a physical, we don't have a hologram that p p pops up every so often. We don't have bellowing from the mountaintops of, of, the, of how, how to live. It's just a record. Mm -hmm. And well, we do have the spirit of truth yeah. that, that God can use to, to uh, that's about all we really have. But if, he, if he was here personally, how would we conduct ourselves? We would be... maybe. Well, and, I, and I, I've, I've suggested this on a few occasions. Suppose God said, well, I want to make myself more, you know, more friendly. 
So he says, I'll, I'll give you an hour once a week. I'll come down and just talk to you personally. If you have any questions, we'll discuss together. If he did that, who do you think would demand equal time? Mm. But he did that in the, in the Garden of Eden, didn't he? Sure. Okay. And, and how much, and how long did that, we don't know, but the, the biblical record is relatively short. And uh, they, they were ready to listen to something else. Uh, familiarity breeds contempt? I hope not. To but, specifically answer your question, if God was with us for an hour, the devil would insist on having an hour with us directly, personally. Wouldn't that be exciting? Well, Spirit. and we really ha have a lot of stories mixed up here. We got the book of Job we start out oh, with, yeah. uh, which is uh, actually more, t more than equal time for the, for the devil's story. But yeah. truth can ring out, you know, and that get is discernment, which comes about by teaching and education. I, uh, before, in the past, I've said, well, God gives, gives data. No, nah, he really, the data, but it's, it's in the teaching mode. Because without, you know, this is a lot of data, but it does, somebody doesn't help you with this. Yeah. By focusing on Christ, we, uh, we uh, submit to him in faith, and our faith grows as we come to know and interact with him. Uh, taste and see that the Lord is good, in, yeah. even in the Old Testament. So... Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So all that is a cycle uh, yeah. that, that happens. But uh, faith, uh, growing trust in God. Uh, the other picture does not create trust. It creates fear. Mm -hmm. uh, I like Fred's word, uh, that word faith that we use. Mm -hmm. But I like what I've learned. One of the, the uh, if you go through a, a Greek lexicon, uh, persuasion is really the preferred uh, uh, translation. How does God persuade? Through teaching. Yes, that's what this statement says. Jesus came to teach men of the Father, to cor correctly represent him before the fallen children. Exactly. And yeah. that process it brings persuasion, yes. for or against. Mm -hmm. Take your choice. And that's yeah. why in chapter 4 of Book Education, she says education and redemption are one and the same thing. Yeah. So it's all about education. It's not a, nothing else, really. Well, Gordon, continue on. You're lo stirring up lots of discussion here. Same article, Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth to set men right through the revelation of God. Okay. The whole purpose of his coming, of his own mission to earth? Was to set men right through the revelation of God. Teach them, that is. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It wasn't to save Was it, us. Wasn't it to pay a price or no. to appease the wrath of God or, or something like that? Not a word is the, in the text from Jesus. And it's the words of Jesus who are going to be our, the judge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Not okay. all of this. Go ahead, Gordon. In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. When the ob object of his mission was attained, Again, the revelation of God to the world. The Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. Amen. And he hadn't even died yet. Yeah, yeah. when that statement was made. So, uh, Jesus clearly, if this passage is correct, which I absolutely believe, Jesus came for one clear reason, to say, folks, this is what God is like. Watch me. Everything I do, this is what God is like. I am sure that Jesus spent hours every night with his Father, planning what they're going to do the next day. And exam one example is just before the time when he chose his 12 disciples, he chose 11 actually, and one Judas tried to join in, but choosing the 11, he spent the whole night in prayer. And I can just see them. Okay, what about Peter? What about John? What about... Are these the best people that I can choose for my... Okay, you, can, I, you can just see them doing that. Well, 
Uh, then you have another short quotation there, Gordon. From Desire of Ages, page 22. The earth was dark through misapprehension of God, that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. Wow. Do we recognize in our thinking and in our preaching, our evangelizing and so forth, that the main reason why Jesus came to this earth was to reveal the truth about the Father? Do we ever separate between the Son and the Father? Do we ever sort of suggest that he, one has to appease the other or persuade the other or plead to the other? You can find passages that are wrongly translated or yeah. mistranslated that get, could give you that impression. Or misread, or misread. Well, yeah. leaving out words. Or add, adding uh, through editing. Yeah. I'm thinking of That's Romans 3.25. Yeah. Which is really a messed up. So what misunderstandings and misconceptions do we have about the Father? Are we ever inclined to suggest that he's arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, even severe, as has been implied, even suggesting by, as suggested by many in the past? Well, careful students of the Bible obviously recognize the circumstances were different in the Old Testament. We're not trying to say that it was exactly the same in the Old Testament as it was in the New Testament. And so there are reasons why, you know, do we act differently sometimes when we're in a different setting than when we're in a different setting? Yeah, absolutely. We should recognize that as a normal thing. So could we really put together in our mind the idea that the, the, the God who came down on the top of Mount Sinai and shook that mountain and was covered with black smoke and there's lightning shooting out and all that kind of stuff, was the same one who spoke sitting quietly on the hillside in the, in, in the days of, of Galilee, on the crowds in Galilee? Moses wasn't afraid, was he? No. Well, not only that, but uh, the people would not have believed it was God speaking if he had come like Jesus did yeah. later on. <laughs> yeah, they exactly. needed this Well, power. that was one of the things the, the, the Jewish leaders said. How is it that you, looking just like us, being a mere man, make yourself mm -hmm. out to be God? Yeah. If you look just like me, then, then you are just like me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, there's some passages to suggest to us that um, Jesus was God and he was the God of the Old Testament. Do you want to share some of those with us, Myra? Sure, these are all from the Good News Bible. John 5, 39. You study the scriptures because you think in them you will find eternal life. And these very scriptures speak about me. Luke 24, 44. And then he said to them, These are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the writings of the prophets, and the Psalms had to come true. And then finally in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the protection of the cloud and all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. So how wet did they get when they were baptized? <laughs> they, they walked through on dry ground, didn't they? Mm. Now, isn't that what it's talking about? Yeah. Well, even in the Old Testament, we discover that God is slow to anger, Psalm 145.8, faithful with unfailing love, Psalm 145. 3, 8. He delights in his followers, Psalm 147, 11. He has every intention of prospering his people and giving them hope, Jeremiah 29, 11. He looks forward to the day when he will no longer need to rebuke his people, but rejoice over them with singing, Zephaniah 3, 17. So to try to suggest that everything is grim and dark and, and hazardous and scary in the Old Testament just isn't true. Well, are we prepared to deal with the implications of the idea that Jesus is in no way different from the Father? 
What is he doing right now? Does he need to plead with the Father? No. Well, he's that pleading wouldn't... with us. He's pleading, pleading with, with us. us. And he's, he's revealing through the Spirit the Father. We see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So that's part of his intercessory work is, is being able, standing between us and the mm-hmm. Father and showing us something that yeah. we cannot see without being destroyed. Yeah. Uh, he's giving us what we can see so that our will can be softened and we can see more and more. Do we, uh, did Jesus himself say anything about his pleading with the Father? No. Um, the, well, he did, but not yeah, what people so usually think of. He doesn't plead. Yeah. John 16, verses 25 and 26 and on into 27. I have used, fig- this is Jesus speaking to his disciples at the very end of his time with them in the upper room. I have used figures, in fact, it was after they left the upper room. They were already on their way to Gethsemane. I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come. Well, and I, I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. Aha! Now we're going to get the truth, right? When that day comes, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf. Hold on, wait a minute. What about the whole Old Testament thing with priests and all that kind of stuff? And then he says, for the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God and going on. Jesus himself said, I will, I'm not going to do it. Are we going to accept his word? Or are we going to say, no, we can't believe that. It's too far-fetched. God so loved the world that he gave. So that says that... Uh, as Jesus said, the Father himself loves you. So it's not about changing God's mind, it's about changing our mind, Mm -hmm. transforming us from one degree of glory to the next so that we can once again behold the face of the Father. And that changing of our mind is, another word would be salvation Mm -hmm. or healing, right? Yeah. Yeah. See, the misconception is it comes from a pagan understanding of the priesthood again, because there in the priesthood, the priest is there to represent humans before God. Mm-hmm. But that's not the job of a priest. The priest represents God, or actually represents what the prophets have received from God, and they in turn bring it to the humans. That's his role. It's a flow that com- comes from God through the prophets and the priest to us humans. And this is where the priests of Israel failed Mm -hmm. because they never really did that. They were trying to portray themselves as uh, mediators between humans and God uh, as forgiving the sins of those humans here on earth so that God could accept them. And that's not at all what their role was supposed to be. Unfortunately, we know in the history of the great controversy that sin has created an enormous gap between us and God. It talks about that in Isaiah 59 too. Unless something is done about this separation, we are hopelessly lost and God did what it took. Romans 8 verse 3, I think we need to just read that. It's such a fantastic verse. What the law could not do, in other words, the whole Old Testament system couldn't do it, because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son who came with a nature like sinful human nature to do away with sin. To do away with sin. And that process to do that is teaching, it's education, which is redemption. Mm -hmm. The one who created the entire vast universe became a human being and died the death of a traitor, even the death of a common criminal, Philippians 2, 5 to 8. So what do we learn from that? Could there be any question about God's love any longer? I certainly hope mm-hmm. not. Mm-hmm. From the time that Jesus came to, the, to this earth up to our present time, there have been those who do not believe that Jesus Christ could be fully human and fully divine at the same time. It's just too huge a gap for them to wrap their minds around. So, 
Dennis, I think this is yours. Or right here. It's mine. Oh, it's Fred. I'm in sorry. Christ, yeah. In Christ yeah, is life, original and unborrowed and underived. He that hath the Son hath life. 1 John 5, 12. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. E.G. What Desire of Ages, 530, paragraph 3. That's a pretty definitive statement, isn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. But that same God came down to this earth and risked everything on behalf of God and heaven and the universe, becoming a baby boy born of a sinful teenage human mother. And what did he prove by doing that? He came to the world to display the glory of God. And I'm now reading from Desire of Ages again. This is page 665. And the glory is his? Character. Character. Yeah. Which he, is his humility. Yeah. <laughs> he came to the world to display the glory of God, that man might be uplifted by, well, and proof of that is he didn't go around with bright shining Aura. apparel and a, a crown on his head. No. Very humble. So he came to, to display the glory of God that man might be uplifted by its restoring power. God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. Jesus revealed no qualities, exercised no powers that men may, and women too, my right, I'm not going to leave you out, that men may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess. If they will be in subjection to God, there's the humility as God, as he was. So amazing. I mean, that's, that just blows you away. So this means that the one who could speak the command and create a world, remember Psalm 38, I'm sorry, 33, 6, and 9? Just look at that real quick. The Lord created the heavens by his command, the sun, moon, and stars by his spoken word. He gathered all the seas in one place. He shut up the ocean depths and star rooms. He worshiped the Lord and all the earth. Honor him, all people of the world. When he spoke, the world was created. At his command, everything appeared. I wonder, did he, did, he under, did he comprehend that himself when he was living here? That he could speak and create a world? Well, it allowed himself to become, he allowed himself to become a helpless baby boy lying in a manger. Okay. Fred, I think it's your turn now. Yeah, Romans in Romans 8, 8 uh, 38, 39, we're told, For I am certain that nothing can separate us from, the lo from his love, neither death nor life, neither angels other, nor other uh, heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the worlds above or the worlds below, there is nothing in all of creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Wow. From the Good News Bible. Back when I was in high school, this was my favorite verse in the whole Bible. Oh, yeah. I just loved this passage, memorized it. But now I have so many favorite verses, I, do, I can't, I can't, I the, can't settle on just one. The, the problem is that all too often we interpret this as meaning Christ's love for us or God's love for us. Uh, yes, it is, but it's more than that. It's us adopting his love for others as he had it for us. Mm -hmm. Is that really possible? It's a progressive work. Yeah. Given this... Life. Given this truth about God, why would anyone choose to be separated from the love of God? Well, our, our Bible they study... They go their own way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The third member of the Godhead, known as the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, has been very much misunderstood down through history. Dennis, I think that next one from the Bible study guide is yours. Uh, but Scripture proves his personhood. Christians are baptized in his name along with the Father and the Son, Matthew 28, 19. The Spirit glorifies Christ, John 16, 14. The Spirit convicts people, John 16, 8. He can be grieved, Ephesians 4, 30. He is a comforter, John 14, 16. Helper and counselor, uh, depending on the translation. He teaches, he teaches Luke 12, 12, and intercedes, uh, Romans 8, 26, and sanctifies, 1 Peter 1, Two, Christ said the Spirit guides people into all truth, John 16, 13. 
In short, the Holy Spirit is God, as are the Father and the Son. Together they are one God, adult uh, Sabbath School Bible study guide for Tuesday, April 24. Okay. Well, the Holy Spirit does many wonderful things for us, uh, the ones that's basically ones that we've already mentioned there. The Holy Spirit has taken up the work left by Jesus when he was on this earth. That work is simply to reveal the truth about God and to lead us into that truth. We have been, okay, I think that's your Gordon, yours, Gordon. From Ellen White, Sermons and Talks, Volume 2, page 136 to 137. We have been brought together as a school, and we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds unseen by human eyes that the Lord God is our keeper and helper. He hears every word we utter and knows every thought of the mind. Okay, what does it mean he's as much a person as God is a person? God is not a human being. The well, Bible, Jesus said God is... We don't know how spirit. they interact amongst no. themselves, but they've chosen to interact with us in three different ways. and. Uh, so the Spirit isn't reacting to us in, in a way, uh, the way the Father is on a throne high and lifted up. He's before the creation and he's the focus of worship. And mm -hmm. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Mm -hmm. He interacts with his creation on a face-to-face -face basis. But the Spirit is God within that keeps before us the face of the Father. Mm -hmm. So that wherever we are, we can respond to his love, his grace, and act. Uh, our actions then will proceed from that, that spirit. Well, perhaps the greatest evidence of the personhood of the Holy Spirit, our Bible study guide says, uh, and evidence that he is God is the incarnation of Christ. We are told, Matthew 120, let's look at that, Matthew 120. While he was thinking about this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, descendant of David, do not be afraid to take Mary to be your wife, for it is by the Holy Spirit that she has conceived. We, of course, have no idea how that happened. But if we really believe that Jesus was fully human and fully God, then somehow or other, uh, and, you know, we know, we know what happens in our natural human process, there's a 23 uh, genes that, that come from the father and 23 genes that come from the mother. Could Jesus be condensed into 23 perfect genes? We don't know. We don't know how that happened. But somehow a part of Mary was integrated with whatever came from God. And so Jesus could say, I am fully human. I am fully God. So when he called him, did he call himself fully human? Did he call himself fully God? Well, he referred to him as himself as the Son of Man. Which okay, was, what does that mean? He was also the Son of God. Mm -hmm. And he was his <laughs> own father. Well, well in, say, in saying, if you've seen me, to Philip, as we said earlier, the if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So, he, right there, he's identifying himself as God. And he, when he was talking to the Pharisee, well, it was probably the Sadducees. Mm -hmm. He was uh, s saying that uh, before Abraham was, I okay. am, and therefore they picked up rocks to throw him. Because it's interesting that in that passage, in his discussion with the Sanhedrin, he's in front of the Sanhedrin, so it's Pharisees, Sadducees, and there's a few other where others were not part of the Sanhedrin. There were not either Pharisees or Sadducees, apparently, in that group. He said these words. Jesus answered, if I were to honor myself, that honor would be worth nothing. The one who honors me is my father, the very one you say is your God. And by the way, if you look carefully back, he's already said twice, I am who I am in this speech. And they didn't get it. What, do we, what does it mean, I am who I am? Well, back to the burning bush. That's the, that's the Hebrew name for God. So he goes on here, you've never known him, but you, do, you have never known him, you're God. You've never known him, but I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced 
that he was to see the time of my coming. He saw it and was glad. They said to him, you're not even 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? I'm telling you the truth, Jesus replied, and now he's going to make it so clear that they can't possibly miss it. Before Abraham was born, I am. So is, that, is there any equivocation about what he's claiming right there? None. Then they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. I mean, you know, and, and he calls himself repeatedly the Son of Man, so he clearly identifies himself as fully human and fully God. And fully the Creator. Yeah. You know, yeah. All Hebrews, of that implied. Hebrews 1, verse 2 and 3 makes it very clear. He is the Creator. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Gordon, I think you have the next no, one there. No, no, I have. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Myra, Godhead? The Godhead was stirred with pity for the race, and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to working out the plan of redemption. Wow. That's Ellen White from Councils on Health, page 222, paragraph 2. Well, all three members of the Godhead are working for us. What a comforting thought that is. So what is the evidence? Jim, you want to look at those verses from, uh, we've chosen a few verses out of Romans 8. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are, for we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. If God is for us, who can be against us? Certainly not God, who did not even keep back his own son, but offered him for us all. He gave us his son. He will, excuse me, he will not also freely, excuse me, will he not also freely give us all things? Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares them not guilty. Who then will condemn them? Not Christ Jesus who died, or rather who was raised to life, and is at the right hand and is at the right hand side of God, pleading with us excuse me, pleading, pleading with him for us, who then can separate us from the love of God, of Christ? Good news Bible of Romans eight, twenty six to thirty five. Well, many Seventh day Adventists wonder if it is even possible for them to be saved. The instructions and the commands that God has given in the Bible seem to be just too much. I mean, we know about Matthew 7, 14, the, the narrow path. Does that, is that, does that mean, is God trying to make it too hard? Well, no. but to be prepared for the end time, people must have the assurance that salvation is, is possible in the present time. They must be convinced that God is working for them in every way, every way necessary. And they must stand up to the devil without being afraid. Well, there's a lot of passages in the Bible showing how God works for us. Psalm 91, Joel 2, John 10, Romans 10, 1 John 5, I mean, just to mention a few. Do we really believe uh, that all who ask the Lord for help will be saved? That's what Paul said. Do we believe that God has made salvation freely available to every person who will accept it? God will do everything necessary to help us if we're willing to work with him and live the kind of lives that will prepare us for the second coming. Well, how old is the gospel? Has it been around for a while? Everlasting. Mm -hmm. Revelation yes. 14, 6 and 7. Then they saw another angel flying high in the heaven with an eternal, that's another word for everlasting, the eternal message of good news, that's the gospel, to announce to the people of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge. Worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. So this good news has always been there. And it's not just John who said that. Um, First of all, this good news reminds us of what God does, that God does not change, 
before our world was created, God recognized that sin could arise and he made all the necessary preparations. Ephesians 1, 4 to 5 says, even before the world was made, uh, God had already chosen us to be his through our union with Christ so that we would be holy and without fault before him. Because of his love, God had already decided that through Jesus Christ, he would make us his sons and daughters. This was his pleasure and purpose. So what does the word pleasure mean in that situation? Bring choosing. Great joy. Yeah. Uh, well, it's choosing too. And, and legally, you know, what, what happens when they, the judge says, well, or someone says in the court, what's the pleasure of the court? Mm -hmm. Or the pleasure, yeah. It, it means this is the choice that we make. Okay? Well, do we accept, do we really accept in our daily actions and behavior that we are chosen by God? Do we believe that we have literally been said, God has literally said, that one is my child. Do we, do we believe that we have been adopted into God's family? That we have been or that we are being adopted. Okay. I like that. Well, look at 2 Thessalonians 2.13. We must thank God at all times for you, brothers and sisters, you whom the Lord loves. For God chose you as the first to be saved by the Spirit's power to make you his holy people and by your faith in the truth. God called you to, to this through the good news we, we preached to you. He called you to possess your share of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, our brothers and sisters, stand firm and, st and hold on to those truths which we taught you, both in our preaching and in our letter. It's a pretty, pretty straightforward statement, right? Look at 2 Timothy 1.9. He saved us and called us to be his own people, not because of what we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. He gave us this grace by means of Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but now... It has been revealed to us through the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He has ended the power of death and through the gospel has revealed immortal life. Well, so why doesn't everybody just buy it, accept it? Well, I think fear for one thing, uh, people look at themselves. I think you may have a quote from Martin Luther about that mm -hmm. uh, somewhere a little yeah, it's further coming. on. Uh, but uh, people, uh, you know, they look at their lives, they look at uh, what they think about God, and they have great fear of, uh, of, you know, their situation, and they have fear of God, but perfect love casts out fear. So as we grow in our understanding of God's love for us, and we draw, see that through Jesus, uh, it casts out that fear of us being lost and of our fear of coming close to God. God only asks us to accept what he offers. He doesn't ask us to figure out how to save ourselves because we couldn't. He just says, accept the gift. But now what does that acceptance include? We have to take him seriously and take his requests seriously. However, however we must not take the approach that we are once saved, always saved. As free as salvation is, God does not ask us to be presumptuous. Look at Matthew 7, 21 to 23. This is a famous passage. But not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. When judgment day comes, many will say to me, and this, this blows me away every time I read it, Lord, Lord, in your name we spoke God's message. By your name we drove out many demons and performed many miracles. Did they really? Then I will say to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. Okay. These people failed to do at least two things. They sought to perform miracles probably for their own glory. And two, their emphasis was always on themselves. We need to look away from ourselves to Jesus Christ for all our needs. Now, Martin Luther, the comment that you meant there, um, who's, who's next? You're reading it. I think it's, uh, we didn't give it out. No. It's just in the flow okay. of things. Okay. So. Martin Luther is reported to have said, when I look to myself, I don't know how I can be saved. When I look to Jesus, I don't know how I can be lost. 
Could you honestly repeat those words? If people were lost in the end, it will not be because God has failed to provide the necessary means, it will be because they made the wrong choices. Unless one has a knowledge of the great controversy that we have, many of these things might be hard to understand. Do we adequately appreciate God's love for us? What, why does God love us? Are we fully familiar with the evidence from Scripture that God loves us? Because He is love. If we, I'm sorry? Because He is love. Yeah. That's His nature. If you fully recognize that God loves you, does that automatically make you love your neighbor? It should, but in our flesh, we, there are many things that get in the way of that. We, yeah. we have excuses, we have reasonings, and, uh, but uh, as our, our will softens and as we see things as he sees them, uh, then we will be more responsive to that. Okay, but if we really experience the love of God, what happens when someone really loves us? The natural response should be love back, right? And we don't have a chance. We, we love God. I don't have a problem with that, but that love should overflow to others, shouldn't it? Yes. If God saves us, are we in any way responsible for the salvation of our neighbors? Well, that's a challenge. Um, am I responsible for the people in China? I'm responsible for those around me and to do what I can, but I'm not responsible for their choices. I can um, okay. portray, seek to portray the love of God to them, and, uh, and that's light, and they will either be drawn to the light or they'll, they'll hide from the light. Well, there's... Many religions have a kind of emotional or mystical part of, their, of their, their religious experience. Christianity is based on the beautiful history of the most amazing life that has ever been lived on this earth. It's based in reality. This, is, this should be the great reality show, right? Mm -hmm. This is reality like you wouldn't believe. Well, like we should believe, but we, many of us don't. We may recognize that salvation is based on God's free gift, but then we must recognize that salvation will not be fully realized until the end of time when we are taken to heaven by Christ. The okay. last phase is, is changing our bodies, and none of us have experienced that. No. Yet. Not yet. Well, we, 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 some of us are starting to experience changes in our body, but it's not the kind we're looking yeah. forward to. We don't have glorified bodies. Though. No. So what does we expect to happen at the end? How will our lives be different? Well, the challenges must be greater, I would think. Okay. In the, in the end time, we will... So you're saying we're, there's going to be a challenging time and then there's going to be a glorified time. Well, the glorified time is the, when Jesus comes and, you know, this mortal must take on immortality. That's when he comes. Mm -hmm. uh, but that isn't going to be until the... What, what happens appears. between now and then? That, that's a very important question because there has to be growth mm -hmm. in the meantime. Growth of what? We must bear fruit. Mm -hmm. A tree, when it bears fruit, offers its surplus, its food, to mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. He's there to serve others. Likewise, we are here to learn how to become more efficient in our service to others. Yeah. Unfortunately, our, 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 our world is consumed with materialism. Getting, getting, getting. Everything seems to be based, seems to be based on the here and now, Sound bites, I don't have time except just give me the message in, in one minute or less. Entertainment, I mean, how much of our world is consumed with entertainment? And getting ahead at work, I want a better job, I want the corner office, I want the picture window, I want the whatever. So how do we get people who are stuck in that rut to look beyond the here and now? Our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed. 
Uh, well, we look not at the things that are seen, for they're temporal, but things which are unseen, which are eternal in the heaven. So I suppose they need to see that we value eternal things more than we value temporal things. Yeah. How, how can we shake them up a little bit, see their need of salvation? If life is good, it's pretty tough. They're in need of nothing, right? Isn't that what the uh, Laodiceans are? Yeah. Health is good. Economically, you're well enough off. You're, you know, yeah. you're I mean, they don't even need the Word of God. No. Yeah. no. So, I mean, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, many of them would say, well, what do I care about the creation story? How does that affect me? Tells the wrong thing about God, that he would bring about uh, this world through suffering and death and disease and destruction, and those are the agencies that he used. Uh, you could argue that an all-powerful God could have done it that way, but would a God of love have done it that way? Yeah. Can't do it. Right. I, I, I just feel that we're looking for a something that we have to do mm -hmm. versus letting God bring those people into our area of whatever it is that we can provide without going out and going, you need to do this. People are not going to yeah. respond to well, that. And, and Peter said, remember, be prepared at any time yes. to, to speak the truth when you have an opportunity. And sometimes it comes not in speaking or reciting verses. No. It's in your actions. Loving actions. And Jesus' example is that he, he prayed. He said, you know, he spent time in prayer with, and he said, I, I do nothing except what I see the Father doing. I don't speak except what the mm -hmm. Father gives me. So I, I think that's, that's one place that we need to start. Certainly mm -hmm. scripture is part of that uh, as well. Because uh, he yeah. he was immersed in scripture, I'm sure. Yeah. But uh, without that coming together uh, with God and and what do you want me to do today, God? And uh, being open to that. Open to and that. Yeah. I think Allowing we need him to work through you. We, we need to remember Paul, who was immersed in scriptures, yeah. but he had the wrong understanding of scripture. The same scripture transformed him later on mm -hmm. because Jesus intervened in his life, no doubt, and said, why are you persecuting me? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine being told by God, why do you persecute me? That yeah. caused him to go back to Scripture and study it for more than three yeah. years, and he found exactly. a new meaning to yeah. the very same words he had been reading for 30 years or whatever. I call that a food basket upset. <laughs> yeah. Well, and all of that, we need to recognize that God will never save us because of some special thing that we do. We never, no, we'll never be able to earn salvation. But we do need to work with God in, in, in transforming us. God saved us because he loves and is for his own name's sake. We are the trophies of his plan of salvation. Well, we read in Romans 8 there, Jim helped us with, love is the predominant characteristics of the Holy Spirit as well as of the Father and the Son. Both Christ and the Holy Spirit are referred to as comforters or advocates, John 14, 16, and 26, and 1 John 2, 1. The Greek word parakletos, or comforter, is translated in the Greek Septuagint from the Hebrew word nacham, meaning to console. So the Holy Spirit and Jesus are here to console us, Jeremiah 16, 7, Hosea 13, 14, and Isaiah 57, 18. The reason why it is safe and certain that salvation is available is that it is an act of God. While it has implications for how we live our lives here and now, a long-term application is that we will live with God forever. That's a long time. We can look forward to the time when Jesus will appear, Luke 17, 24, and the entire heavens will be full of bright shining angels so that every eye will see him, Revelation 1, 7. No false Christ will ever be able to duplicate such a coming. Sometimes it may seem that human life is just running around in mad circles. There are some people who want to make it sound like that. God provides a way out, and it's a glorious, wonderful way out. Seventh-day Adventists have a two-part name. 
Some of us tend to put too much emphasis on the seventh day part, focusing on this world and how good we are at obeying God's commands, all ten of them. Others may want to emphasize the advent part of our name and focus only on what is coming in the future. It is really important that we understand that we, we understand and comprehend and incorporate both aspects of our name and their implications and live accordingly. We have covered an enormous amount of material in this lesson. I, I think you recognize that. Do you have any questions about the fact that Jesus came primarily to teach us the truth about God? Do we really believe that Jesus is just like the Father, just like his Father? and that there's no reason for him to plead with his father. Or that the father is just like Jesus. How about that? Do we really believe that salvation is a free gift from God that we only have to accept? So how does God give it to us? Education. Yeah. Show us your book there, Jim. That's, yeah, there you go. It's, it's, I mean, he says, here it is. I'll spread it on the pages. I'll describe it to you in, in the stories of Adam, Eve, uh, Moses, Abraham, I mean, down through the book. These, these are the stories that teach you how, how I love people, how, how, how I want to relate to human beings. God cannot educate if you don't have a willingness to listen and take instruction. That's why I would, that's a minimum requirement. Mm -hmm. well, that's Exodus 19, where he says, if you listen to me, we translate if you do what I tell you to do, you know. No, if, uh, the, the Septuagint is very clear. If you listen to my words, I'll make of you a kingdom of priests and kings. Yeah. So what does accepting mean? Well, Ellen White put it in these words, and I in the Bible it does too, but of course it's in a little bit different language. But Ellen White says that by beholding, we become changed. So how much time do we, do we take per day absorbing what we know about Jesus Christ? That is what will change us absorbing what we know about Jesus Christ. It's through reading, it's through hearing, it's through studying, it's through watching, if in some cases we're watching a videos that say, that teach us something about that. But we need to demonstrate, because there's other people who aren't gonna say, well, give me a Bible, give me a, an evangelistic series, I wanna go here. They're, what they're gonna see of the gospel is you and me. So if you were the only gospel that uh, somebody saw, how convinced would they be? Would they want to be more like Jesus? Would they want to be more like you or like me? That's our challenge. Are we ready for that level of action? Our kind and wonderful Father, you know how much we would like to be like you, to be like your son who came and lived as a human being. Unbelievable situation. And yet, there he was a baby boy and lived that incredible life all the way to the cross and then that fantastic resurrection when he came forth in his own power. We will never be able to do that, but help us to live as close to that life as we possibly can is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.